223 versus 556. I'm so tired of all the misinformation that's out there on this subject. Everyone seems to be an expert. However, it seems no one is able to provide any data to back up their conclusions. Today, I'm going to try and explain the true differences between 223 and 556. I'll briefly cover the differences in chambering, differences in brass if there is any, measured velocity and pressure on six different 223 and four different 556 offerings covering the 55, 62, and 75 grain projectiles, as well as some reloading considerations. The tools we're going to use to take all of this crazy data is our lab radar chronograph for velocity, the pressure trace 2 for our chamber pressure, for anything involving weights, we're using our A&D FX120i that can read down to 0.02 grains. The case sounds we measured with our Bison Armory case volume gauge. The annealing codes will be generated with our amp annealer with the Aztec mode upgrade. CBTO measurements will be taken with my Matoyo calipers and the 223 projectile insert from Short Action Customs. Our test platform is an 18 inch SPR barrel from White Oak Armament, chambered in 223 Wild. If the data we go over today doesn't fit the narrative you've been taught, I'm sorry. Well, not really. Let the negative comments begin. First, let's talk chambering. Every chamber is going to be a little bit different, so if you're dying to know what yours is, just measure it. Things like Sarasafe exist, and if you're curious, you can use this material to measure your chamber. There are tolerances on everything. The first clue how similar 223 and 556 really are, for reloaders anyways, are the dies. Dies are the same. If you really dig into the details, you'll find the biggest difference in these two chamberings is the freebore. If you want to be overdramatic, according to the drawings, 556 has double the freebore of 223. But double the freebore in this case is an additional 25 thousandths. So what does this really mean? If your chambers were exactly to the drawing, then the projectiles essentially would have to travel 25 thousandths extra before it engaged the rifling. Everything else being equal, this will allow cartridge overall length to be a little bit longer on 556 and still maintain slightly lower pressures. Next, let's talk about 10 factory offerings. While impossible for me to test every option that's out there, especially with supply chain the way it currently is, I think looking at this data overall will tell us all we need to know. Let's talk about these by grain weight, starting with our 55 grain offerings, and all of these will be testing a minimum of 10 rounds each. Our 55 grain options are from PMC, MFS, Winchester, and Tula. Two of these brass case, two of them steel. Our 223 offerings are going to start at 29,049 feet per second on average what we had with our PMC bronze, all the way up to the MFS option that maxed out at 3,048 feet per second on average. Moving up to the 556, we can see our lowest offering started out at 30,096, as well as our highest offering went up to 32,031 feet per second, a significant increase over the 223. In fact, the average velocity of the 223 was 3,012 feet per second, while the 556 had an average velocity of 3,164, for a difference of 152 feet per second on average. Well, what about 62 grains? Our 62 grain options are from MFS, as well as another option I'd never heard of, Hotshot Elite and an SS109 offering in 556. The average velocity of our 62 grain MFS was 6862 feet per second, while the SS109 load was all the way up at 3030 feet per second. So the difference between these two offerings, 168 feet per second. Our 75 grain offerings, one is gonna be a remanufactured option by Ultramax, and the other option is the Hornady Frontier in 556. Our remanufactured ammo has mixed cases, both 223 and 556, and the velocity it produced was 2,555 feet per second. The Hornady Frontier, much higher, 2,788 feet per second, for a difference of 233 feet per second. Clearly, the majority of our 556 ammo was significantly higher velocity than 223. But most of us probably already knew that. But at the higher cost of velocity is pressure. And this is where some of the arguments typically start. Realize that 223 and 556, when they were made, were actually measured with different pressure standards. While I'm not going to go into this in great detail, Ultimate Reloader has a good video on 223 and versus 556 that can give you a lot more information on the history of how these cartridges came to be and some of their physical differences. But today we're going to be measuring with the same pressure device, our Pressure Trace 2. Now I don't want to distract from this, but I do want to make you aware that the data that I'm going to go over is corrected. I'll put all the raw data on your screen real quick, and you can see that this really doesn't change the conversation much. To use this device, I have to use a calibrated offset to bring the pressure in line from what's expected. However, highlighting differences in 223 and 556, this is going to make very little change. On your screen, you can see the lowest pressure belonged to the PMC bronze on average, and the highest average pressure belongs to the SS109 load. The key difference is what we're looking at is the difference in pressure. We can see that the average pressure on our corrected data for 223 was 52,781 PSI, while the average corrected pressure for 556 was 58,593. 
a difference of not quite 6,000 PSI. Averaging our max pressures from 556 as well as 223, we can see that 6,124 PSI was the difference between 223 and 556. Corrected or uncorrected, we can see that our average pressure difference between the 223 and 556 offerings is right around 6,000 PSI. So when it comes to pressure, there is a difference between 223 and 556. Regardless of how the standards were measured, 556 factory ammo seems to have higher pressures than 223. But what about the brass? The brass must be different, right? Let's start simple. Just talk about primer crimping. Well, it's true for all the 556 rounds that I have seen, the primers on 556 are crimped. But saying all primers are not crimped on 223 is not accurate either. One of our examples, the Winchester 223, as well as some Federals that I had laying around from range pickups, both had crimped primers on 223 head stamp cases. But what about the case weight? I'm guessing some people talk about case weight simply because they think it has something to do with either the strength of the brass or the case volume of the brass. We'll look at both of those, but we're going to start with the case weight. 556 five, cases must weigh more, right? Well, let's look at our data. Keeping in mind our sample size is a minimum of 10 cases, some have much, much more. Looking at our 223 cases, we can see our heaviest 223 case is 101.65 grains on average, whereas the lowest weight was the Remington cases at 94.46. The highest weight on our 556 five, brass was the SADU 55613 five, head stamp, with an average weight of 102.4 grains. The lowest was some Lake City brass that had mixed NATO 13 and 15 date codes that had an average case weight of 92.18 grains. So clearly, whether it's 223 or 556, there can be quite a variance in the actual case weight. But what about the composition of the brass, right? That's where we're going to find a difference. To help analyze this, we're going to be using my amp annealer with an Aztec mode upgrade. In case you're not familiar, you have to sacrifice one case to generate a code for each lot of brass to make sure that it's annealed correctly. All you really need to know for this is that the code is based on how much energy it takes to anneal it correctly. So a thicker case neck is going to require a higher number because it's going to take more energy to properly anneal it. So I sacrificed at least one piece of brass per head stamp and got the following chart. We can see when it comes to 223, the lowest was the Lake City 223 Remington, along with a Federal with a code of 0122. The highest, the AUSA, which of course was our heaviest, with an annealing code of 0131. Moving on to the 556 brass, the lowest on it was actually the same. Lake City, NATO 21 date code, with a annealing code of 0122. The highest was the SADU 55613 date code, but had the annealing code of 0132. As you can see, there's really not a significant difference in the power that it takes to anneal these cases, so the brass really isn't much different. And one interesting highlight is the Lake City 2230122 and the Lake City NATO 21 are this year date code cases, have essentially identical weights as well as identical annealing codes. But there's still going to be a difference in the case volume, right? Let's go look at case volume. So all these case volumes are measured with fired brass since I wasn't going to be able to resize the steel cases. Separating our 223 again, our lowest case volume was the Tula at 31.3 grains and the highest on average was a tie between some Lake City 223 Remington as well as the PMC at 31.65 grains of water. On the 556, the SADU 55613 had the lowest at 31.14 grains of water, but the highest capacity was the Lake City NATO 13 brass that had 31.75. A close second though was the PMC at 31.74 on average. Taking all these different brands and averaging them together, we can see that the average weight has to be different, right? Except it's not. The average case volume on the six different 223 brands was 31.56, while the average on the six 556 cases was 31.54. So, unless you want to call 0.02 grains of water a difference, there really isn't. So if there isn't a difference in the brass, it's got to be how they're loaded, right? Let's look at the cartridge overall length. Actually, we're going to be looking at CBTO, or cartridge based to O-Jive, because it's going to be more relevant when we're talking about the distance to the lands. Now first, I will say this is not a perfect science. The tool we are using is going to be made by Short Action Customs to the correct dimensions to mimic a chamber 223 barrel. However, some of the projectiles will give you a slight difference, but again, it'll get us very close for today's data. Now the CBTO measurement to my lands is about 1.844 inches with most of the projectiles I've tested it so far. However, the Hornady 75 grain projectile that we use today is 1.833 inches. Hopefully that chart will give you an idea of how far things are jumping, at least a rough estimate. So we can see all of our 223 offerings there. Our shortest is going to be the Winchester at 1.759 CBTO. The longest is the MFS at 1.8065 inches. But the shortest 556 is basically the same at 1.804. 
However, the Federal does stretch out to 1.8115 inches. So on average, the 5.56 is a little bit longer, but certainly not right up on the lands. Moving on to the 62 grain projectiles, the opposite is true. The MFS 223 62 grain offering has a CBTO of 1.065, where the SS-109 projectile is loaded to a CBTO of 1.770, significantly shorter. The 75 grain projectiles, the Ultramax remanufactured 1.754 inches. However, the Hornady Frontier had it stretched about all the way out basically right on that lands at 1.830 inches. So in general, it appears the 5.56 are a little closer to the lands, but not as always, as you can see. So what about using our 5.56 ammo in a 2.23 then? Well, I'm never going to tell you it's okay. You need to decide for yourself. Clearly, the difference between 223 and 556 is not the brass, it's not the way the measurement was taken, it's the pressure limits that they're loaded to, and the distance the projectiles are to the lands. Now, Sammy's advice is to consult a manufacturer of your FRM for using 223 and a 556, and never using 556 and a 223. And frankly, I think this way you will always be safe. But what about reloading 556 brass? The sage advice I heard from another reloader was to use 223 data for 223 cases and 556 data for 556 cases. Clearly, the difference in these cases has nothing to do with what's stamped on the case head. So frankly, I don't really understand that advice at all. With any load, you need to start low and work up your pressure. And unless you really need that max velocity for some reason, your cases generally will last longer if they're not loaded to that max velocity anyway. Always use safer loading practices and looking for pressure signs along the way when you're increasing charge weights. If you're interested in reloading for this caliber or any other, check out this video right here where I show you five mistakes to avoid for new reloaders. I hope to see you come back next week, and until then, stay safe in small groups.